we end on Saturday, so three, two, two days. <coughs> Great. And how many people are in the room? About ten. Awesome. Well, I'll just jump in and uh, we'll try and keep it a little bit shorter as we've had some technical uh, difficulties so folks can uh, get what they can out of this and, and hopefully find themselves in a place that uh, it's useful. Um, uh, I, uh, I was sitting where you were uh, six years ago. I was working at OUR Eco Village first as an intern, and then I took my PDC there. And then uh, coming into the winter, I was hired on as a designer uh, within the organization uh, through a job creation partnership working with the British Columbia government. And somebody had mentioned to me that Jude Hobbs was teaching and was offering this advanced teachers workshop, so I uh, talked to Brandy and helped to organize uh, Jude's first visit there, and uh, I'm pleased to say that she's been coming back ever since, so I think we did something right. I don't know. Um, ever since that time when I was working with Jude, I found uh, a great love and a great desire to teach, and also a great love and desire to design and implement. Now, over the last little while, I, uh, I've been teaching uh, permaculture design courses, short courses, uh, and soon found that there was a lot of people who weren't quite sure about what they were doing. Uh, with permaculture. They were given high octane fuel, they were ready to go, but they didn't really know where they wanted to go. And Toby Hemingway has a great way to explain this, which is these folks, they come out of a PDC, they'd be super stoked, they ran down the buffet line of permaculture, they had a little trees, they had a little social permaculture, and they'd go out and they'd start seeing people and they'd go, hey, can I tell you about permaculture? It's, it's great, there's swales and everything else. And they would be like these big yellow dogs that would come up and they would just shake all of their permaculture excitement all over to anybody who was close. And uh, a lot of people would kind of like come back in revulsion going, I don't know what you're talking about. This is all a big mishmash. Um, and then, I don't know if this resonates with a lot of you, but folks would start to do this permaculture wander where after their intro or after their PDC, they start wandering with permaculture. They try this over here and try that, try that over there. And so what came out of that and what came out of teaching was a desire to see people uh, get up and get going really quickly with permaculture and to understand where they are and what they're doing. So my big love uh, within all of this has been the land and design, but I found that so many people needed to go back to the drawing board first to really understand what this system was doing, what that zone zero zero system was doing before it went out and cultivated land. Because as Bill Mollison says and as Jeff Lawton says, the solutions in the world are exceedingly simple, but the problem started with the climate in between the years and so we need to fix the climate between the years before we start as well. Um, so that being said, I kind of want to jump into this here. Uh, this whole process has become called cultivated life design, which is really taking the number one thing that we all need to design, which is our lives to heart, and to, to work on that first and foremost. Um, I have a bit of a, uh, a, a motto, which is to wake up, kick ass, and repeat. It's pretty much wherever I am, and uh, I use it to remind myself that uh, we need to, and I need to, jump into this as soon as I can every single morning. Is that showing up for everybody? Can everybody see that slide? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, must be. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about cultivated life design. Um, my company is called All Points Land Design, and that's the company that I design through and educate through and implement. I also created something called Permaculture British Columbia which is all about designing and understanding and spreading and connecting people within permaculture. Three and a half, four years ago when I designed this company, uh, permaculture was, um, it was, uh, in terms of Google Analytics, 75% of the people who were searching for permaculture were coming from within the geological, or pardon me, the geographical boundaries of British Columbia. And 50% of the searches were terminating in British Columbia. So it was, uh, it was what I thought to be the most important place to be. Now, for folks who want these slides, you can take a look at that URL there, permaculturebc.com backslash cld-2015, and you can go on to uh, uh, my website, and you can download these slides after you just uh, fill out a, a little survey about how you liked it. So don't worry about taking a lot of notes. Um, you're, uh, you're more than happy just to listen and, and go with this. 
I'll tell you this much, though. Uh, cultivated life design or designing your life is probably the hardest thing to do. Um, this was a couple of years ago. I was working in Kenya. This is Brian from Uganda and, and, uh, and Tony down or up from Nairobi. We were putting in a ferro cement pond that raises about 1,000 tilapia fish a year, increasing the annual income of this farm by about 410%. So why do I put this in here? I, I put this in here to say that, yeah, we can have people tell us about life design, but if these folks aren't actively working in this, we may want to be suspect about where that information comes from. Um, this cultivated life design process has a few different steps. The first is holistic life design. Second is what's called zones of brilliance. Third is called niche dating, which I'll get into. Uh, the P3 model, I don't know if we'll have time for tonight because we've been starting so late and you guys are probably quite tired. Um, business modeling and business canvassing and then to model businesses playfully. Another mentor of mine, Sepp Holtz here, introduced this to me. But today we're really going to talk about holistic life design and zones of brilliance. So uh, that young chap, that's me, back when I was just a wee gaffer. Um, and I got into business really early on. If you can imagine, that sweet kid was uh, drawing, uh, drawing pictures with his crayons and his paper when he was about eight. Put him into his red wheelbarrow, took him around the, the neighborhood. I went door to door trying to sell him for 10 cents. Uh, didn't have too many takers, but every once in a while somebody was re real interested. And then I realized something about business quite early on, which we're all in. Nature is transaction. Nature is the energy exchanges between different elements. And as Lawton and Mollison say, everything in nature gardens, and this is what this is for us, it's exchange. So I walked up to this one house, and lo and behold, uh, a German shepherd, uh, part Doberman Pinscher German shepherd, come up and told me what he thought about my uh, business. And, uh, you know, they say business takes blood, sweat, and tears. Well, he took a little bit of blood that time. And uh, I say this to say that when we teach, we have to be aware of what and how we present ourselves. And in light design, we have to be aware of what is the core of who we are. I always had a love of showing people my gifts and my talents, and I think we all do. I think that's within us and has been within us for many years. Um, that's not me. That, that didn't just happen overnight. This was another business I had when I was about 12. I sold these uh, little peel and stick uh, tattoos. This was at a summer camp of mine. That's when I learned about business regulations because I had the, the two summer camp counselors say, you know, you can only sell those job in between 4 and 5 p.m. when we're finished the summer camp. So I had a big love of, of explaining and expressing art at a, as a young kid and helping people to understand. Uh, I learned about professionalism when I was about 14 or 15 when I had my first landscaping business. I learned that this is not the proper way to present yourself to clients. But over the years, I've developed Permaculture British Columbia, which is going through a complete revamp to become a hub of permaculture within British Columbia. Uh, I work on uh, urban and rural designs. This is the design that we, we just I just completed this morning via Google SketchUp, which is a tool for design, and uh, is going into implementation in a week and a half. Um, we do broad-scale design as well. Uh, this is just north of Kamloops uh, in Barrie. This is an earth ship. And we put in a lot of Sepp Holzer style work because that was the appropriate piece to put here. And this is what we're talking about when we're talking about light design. What's appropriate for us? How do we allow for growth and for beauty to come out of us by just observing ourselves and finding these patterns that we have? How do we apply key line to our souls? How do we find leverage points? How do we find places where our energy naturally wants to come together in collection before it disperses again, just like this key line garden that <clears throat> I recently put together with a group of students down in Cuba not uh, not four weeks ago. But it's the exact same thing. So life design, when we take it from a permaculture standpoint, gives us all the tools we need. Uh, we can do these Skype conversations. This is I work a lot with Skype and a lot with Google Hangouts. Uh, the bottom left-hand picture is me working with a group of folks on cultivated life design. We're having a breakfast with um, their whole family, we're telling jokes. Uh, I've got my tea and biscuits, so they have their tea and biscuits. These are clients on the, the right-hand side here. These are clients in Ontario. That's my friend Luke Callahan. I work with colleagues. I, I do this work with um, permaculture professionals. Recently been working with Toby Hemingway, as well with Maddie Harlan, the editor of Permaculture Magazine. And uh, it really all came out of the fact that the world is highly degraded, which you folks all know. 
But I pose this to you. If the world is as degraded as we think it is, and if we are in the predicament that we all believe, and we talk about late into the night with many libations in hand, doesn't that mean that it's all hands on deck? Doesn't that mean that we need every single one of us in exactly the way we show up, being able to take responsibility for ourselves? It really means that you and I are needed now, just as we are focused and in action. We need to be able to express ourselves who we are. We can't be Jeff Lawton. We can't be Jude Hobbs. We can't be Sepp Holter. We can't be Marisha Arbuck. We can't be all of these incredible figures in permaculture. We can only be ourselves. So how do we do that when we go through a PDC and we just stuff content in, and then we go say, I'm going to be a composter. I'm going to go out there. I'm going to be an amazing composter. Well, last year during Permaculture Voices, which is this very large permaculture conference, <clears throat> I gave a very similar talk. Back then it was called Function and Niche, which as you learn in marketing, the confused mind says no. So when you call it Function and Niche, which is a great term for us permaculturalists, for most other people, they don't get it. But I gave this presentation. This gentleman came up to me afterwards. And he goes, you changed my life. And I said, why is that? He goes, I was a mechanic before I came to permaculture. Now that I'm in permaculture, the last three years, four years, I've been trying to become a, a great composter. But I'm not a great composter. I'm actually, I'm shitty at it. <laughs> I don't do it that well at all. He goes, you've taught me, you've given me permission that I can now be a permaculturalist who's a mechanic. I can just apply my trade that I already love to what I do. And maybe down the line, maybe in a phasing plan, just as we phase within lands, we can phase in life. Maybe two, three, four, five years down the road, you can phase in composting. But if we don't work with low-hanging fruit, places in our zoning aspect that are closest to us, we're always going to be expending a lot of energy out there on the fringes. Because working out in zone four takes a lot more energy than walking out the front door. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I want to do for the next couple of minutes, I don't know, how long do you folks have to stay awake and stay engaged? Are we at 30 minutes more or 40 minutes more? How much you got in you? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear us? I can, but consensus is what? 30 minutes, 45? We're going to talk till 2? What are we doing? Let's, let's do 45 minutes. Okay. Does that work for pretty much everyone there? Okay, and even though I can't see you, I'll just give you permission now. If you have to go, if you're tired, if this doesn't resonate with you, just get up, lob two feet, find where you need to be for the rest of the night. If that's to recharge, to be ready for folks tomorrow, then go for it, you know? I, it's no sweat off my back. I can't even see you. So really, I wouldn't know any, <laughs> any other way. Some of you are Canadians. You have it by default that we, we always do what we think is in everyone else's best interest, but... Starting today, I really want everyone to start doing what's in their own best interest in some way, shape, or form. So just going back to the slides here, um, I want you focused in an action, which means that most of us, most of us have to really become focused in what we do, and we need to come to the two most important days of our lives. The first is the day we're born, and the second is we, the day that we find out why. Now, that's a really important piece that came from Mark Twain, which is, if we are going to stay on this planet, if we are going to be totally activated, we need to know why we are here. And anybody who comes to us, we need to tell them that this is why we are here. And this is our ruthless clarity of vision. This is from Lisa Helps, um, a friend of mine who became the mayor of Victoria. She has this beautiful saying, the ruthless clarity of vision. And that once we have that ruthless clarity of vision, any opportunity that comes to us, we can either say yes to it or we can say no to it. That's a really important piece. It's kind of like being pregnant. There's no sort of being pregnant. I'm not kind of pregnant. I either am pregnant or I am not. You are either in your ruthless clarity of vision or you are not. <clears throat> either you have an opportunity to come to you like this course or like uh, potentially you've talked to somebody there and you've got a great opportunity to go and work and teach someplace and that works with what you need or you don't. Now, if you haven't thought about this, this is one of the first time to really allow this to come into play for you and let, er and let yourself really know that this is an important piece to have in your life. So what does this look like, though, in actuality? Because this is a, a nice platitude, but what does it mean in nuts and bolts? Because we're about design. Well, if we had a little bit more time, I would have told, I would have asked you folks what you're here for, but 
as we don't have all that much time, we're going to slide through and we're going to start talking about some of the barriers we have. One of them being that if you don't design your life, somebody else is going to design it for you. And most of us have experienced that. Most of us have gone through institutionalized learning, through jobs, through soil and, uh, pardon me, through soul deconstructing and eating processes that make us into these cogs that fit somebody else's life design. And it's usually for their benefit, not for ours. So if you do not design your life, somebody else will. And that takes a lot of civil courage. This comes from Seth Holtz. Here's a man who continually goes out and says, listen, we need to retain more water in the landscape. And when he has questions, especially in America, and in the Americas where they say, well, isn't, you know, don't we have to get permission for that? And in some, some places we absolutely do. I'm not saying that this is a carte blanche for we should just do everything without permission. I'm saying we need to have civil courage within ourselves to stand up and we need to appoint ourselves to be the people to go out and do this work. Last but not least, we've been failing so terribly for so long as a species, truly. We haven't been doing that well for the last 14,000 years. It's time for us to embrace the word failure and realize that it's time for us to fail better. It's time for us to do more than we've ever done before in a better place than we've ever done before. And so I use these three pieces to realize for myself that there's people out there that want me to think the way they're thinking, and that might not be inside what Brad Lancaster calls the natural law, because there's two types of laws in this world, natural law, and there's hu uh, natural law and human law, which one gets to bat last. So this has given ourselves permission to go out and fail with high-grade information and skillful execution, like my other mentor, Richard Walker, likes to say. Last year, I ran an online course with this. Of 35 people internationally who took the course, 14 people showed up regularly. Of the 14 people who showed up regularly, about 13 people finished the course. And of those 13 people in surveys and conversations over the past year, I had 42% of people say that they were happier, healthier, or wealthier of the course and were moving closer towards their goals and were happier for it. So 42% isn't a bad conversion rate. It's also the answer to life, the universe, and everything, which I'm pretty happy about that the coincidence happened. That's a joke for anybody who can't uh, or doesn't see Douglas Adams or read Douglas Adams, but we'll let that go. <laughs> um, so when I ask people to design their lives, a lot of people would look at me like I was crazy, like, you want us to design our lives? Do you know how much work that takes? And I would say, I get that. I understand that. So over the, over the last couple of years or so, I've been able to make this a bit easier for folks. And as other people start to work within this process, been able to make this just a bit more easier for folks. So I like to call it now that we have this, um, this life coloring book. We have a life coloring book that we just have to fill in. So what does this life coloring book include? Well, oh, parts of this slide didn't load. Uh, let's see if we can uh, show anyways. No, we can't show that. All right, fair enough. Let's keep going. So what does this include? It includes holistic life design, which is based upon holistic management, and it includes um, an invention of mine called Zones of Brilliance. So all we're doing is filling these things in. So holistic life design includes a few pieces. It includes what's called the whole under management. If you're aware of holistic management created by Alan Savory, uh, this is very much analogous. There's a few little tweaks that make it easier for us. There's a holistic context and there's testing questions. Again, all of these slides are available if you just fill out a small survey at the end. Um, so under the whole under management, we have two things that we look for. We look on who are the decision makers in the whole that we are trying to design around. And in this, we can use this tool for anything, be it learning Spanish to designing our lives. Well, first we need to know who makes the decisions in our lives. Well, if it's us and it's just one person, then it's us. If we're in partnership with somebody else, probably both of us. If we have a very strong faith connection, probably the faith that we have connection to or the religious leaders or the faith leaders in that place. A lot of people I work with who are so in touch with nature say one of the decision makers is the land and the sense I get from it. Sure, absolutely. The other piece is the eight forms of capital. This is different from how holistic management is normally taught. Um, and the eight forms of capital include intellectual, spiritual, social, material, financial, living, cultural, and experiential capital. It means that every one time we can be developing many different forms of capital in our lives and we can convert those different forms to different types. This is a great place for us to start to see really how rich and wealthy we are. 
Uh, it was created by Ethan Rowland and Gregory Landua. And if you go to eightforms.org, they have a brilliant book that explains this whole piece and even says in it that if we don't take care of zone zero zero, the inner emotional state, that will come back and stop all of our advances within land design. Um, the book is available for donation or you can buy a copy. I think it's about 24 bucks, but I highly recommend it. This is one of the most integral tools I've found to really understanding my life. And also, this comes back into business design later on. Um, can you say that more time, Gavin? Sorry, go ahead. Can you say the tool concept one more time? Sorry, I can't hear you. You have to come closer to the mic. Can you, oh, it's not right there. Can you say the tool method one more time just so people can write it down? The eight forms of capital, eightforms.org? Yep. Yeah. We just can't see it very big. Oh, okay, sure. Eight forms, uh, numero eight forms dot org. Everybody got it? Yeah. Yeah. Super. So to make this easier for the clients and the students I work with in these processes, I started to create um, worksheets, and from students from last year, we started to create these worksheets that people could use and could create for themselves and to really start to understand things. I'm a bit of a spreadsheet guy. I like seeing things in front of me. I like seeing how it looks. Um, so that whole under management um, ends up looking a bit like this. So we have all these different areas, all these different zones. And at the bottom there, you can see that we've got, um, we start with uh, material capital, and that's all of the, the material things we have, um, living capital, all of the, the land, how, how many acres, what type of species do we have there, what kind of seeds we have there, all of these pieces come into play. Spiritual capital includes the reason why we do what we do, um, belief in a change, to need to respond to changing planet, need to adapt to a lower energy future. Cultural capital includes all of the, the taboos and the stories and the myths we walk around with. It also tends to be a place where our clients work in and how we connect with our clients. Our social capital is all the people we know and the capitals that we connect with them. Experiential capital are the things we've done. Intellectual capital is all the things we know. And then finally, Financial capital, and if folks take anything away from this section, this is what I really want people to know about. I want you to absolutely 100% know when you wake up on the first of every month, what is your personal burn rate? What is it that you have to make in terms of money? Because we still run in a money eco ecology and economy, and we need to, to bring that money in. So what is that amount? Because if we don't know that amount, we're stabbing at the dark throughout the month. So this is a way that I've been able to really help folks uh, because I've been, uh, I was going to become a financial advisor years ago. I feel like I dodged a big bullet. And really, there's two ways to get rich. We can either go out and try and make more and more money, but our needs kind of, they, they trail behind us and they keep coming up behind us. And more and more and more, we, we usually have more needs that come up behind us. So that's one of these things we have to be aware of. But the other way, the other way to get wealthy and rich is just to drop our needs and all of a sudden we have all this wealth beside us. So if we don't know what our burn rate is, then we can't reduce that burn rate because we can't manage what we don't measure. So we have to have metrics and we'll talk about metrics today about life. How do you, how do you measure your life? How do you take metrics from your life? How do you take meaningful metrics? You now Elaine Ingham gave us these beautiful metrics for the Soil Food Web, but how do we do that on a daily basis with ourselves. Like how do we how do we come to those metrics? And so this is one metric, this, this spreadsheet, this is one metric that we have to work with. Um, when we take a look at <clears throat> the next piece, which is the holistic context, this includes a statement of purpose, which can be pretty overwhelming for people when we say, why do you exist in the world? It includes quality of life statements, which are things that have to be true, or we want to be true about the whole we manage includes forms of production, things that have to be true so that those quality of life statements are true. And then finally, if everything goes right in this world, if absolutely everything is ecstatically perfect, the future resource base is what will happen. That's our feedback loop. So we readily accept feedback and we apply self-regulation. And so this allows us to know if what we're doing is really working. And I, and I felt this in Cuba recently because I was 
working there with Ron Barazan, the urban farmer, and we had two brilliant TAs with us, Lindsay Meads of Regenerate Design, who took our course two years ago and quit her job at the city, and now she's a permaculture designer of, of great fame within the, the Calgary Public Works Department. Um, if anybody wants a little indicator of how permaculture is going, the city of Calgary now puts, put, puts out requests for proposals, or RFPs, with a requirement or a suggestion that there should be a permaculture designer. So just to let people know that that's how it's going. But I was down in Cuba, and I was working with these folks, and I realized that my brain was a little bit more relaxed down there, and that was one of those future resource-based things that I had laid out for myself in my own holistic context. And so when I come back to Vernon, and I have all these projects, you know, I've got 25 land projects on the go. I've got three different businesses running right now, and I start to get a little cloudy in my mind. I know, okay, this is time for me to reestablish what I'm doing and to go back to my holistic context and see if things are going well. But I'll show you how we do that. So yes, I have a worksheet for that as well because I think it's pretty important for us to understand these pieces uh, that we're doing. So I'll just show you that for a quick second so you can get a sense about what that looks like um, and how we start to conceptualize that holistic context piece. <clears throat> so this is uh, a way for me to iterate. I also have a, a beautiful graphic that I use. Um, so my statement of purpose with my, um, my meta design firm, Wood and Water Land Design, is we exist to mindfully collaborate and create regenerative human supporting ecosystem solutions to grow up joyfully and inspired lives together to wake up, kick ass, and repeat every day. And I got to say, when we say that when we're coming together for our, our monthly meetings, that becomes more true for me every day. And, and if it isn't, then we have, have to go back. Now, quality of life statements, financial quality of life statements, I'll get into these in a second because I'm going to show you how we test these and how we use these because this is a, a tool we use on a daily basis. And it's very important to realize that these aren't just tools that we use um, once or twice. If we don't use them, then they stop being useful. I'm mentoring a, a young man who's doing a landscaping company in Alberta. And both him and the other clients I work with say, when we use this, this is the best tool on the farm. It's the best tool in the business. When we don't use this, we kind of go astray because what we're looking for in life design is a map and a compass to help orient ourselves if we're going properly. Because if we don't have that, we're doing these five years plans and then five years later we don't really know where we are or what's going on. So we need to course correct daily, monthly, hourly, decision by decision. And that's something else that <clears throat> That Alan Savory taught me. I had a great chat with him when I was at Permaculture Voices a couple of weeks ago. Um, he goes, you know, we're, we've left the information age, which most of us think we're still in. But the next iteration of this, not bronze or steel, the next iteration is the decision-making age, to make good decisions with the information we have, not just have a bunch of information. So this is how we make good decisions. Is When we go back to these worksheets, we have our ruthless clarity of vision, and then we are able to test and see if this decision should end up in our life, if this decision over here should go into our life. And we can tell and decide if it's a decision or if it's, a, if it's an income stream, because I'm not just saying we have to build multiple businesses, we can just build different income streams, and I'll show you that in a second. So when we go back to our worksheet here, how do we test these? Because we have to be able to, um, we have to be able to see and to understand what we're doing and have metrics on this. So here's our quality of life and here's our holistic context. But once we get into decision testings, well, we have these seven questions. We have these questions that allow us to understand, OK, will this decision get us in the right direction? Uh, will this contribute to our future resource base? Does this get to the root cause of the problem we're working with? Is the energy and money for this question coming from the proper source? Uh, does it address a weak link within our system, be it social or economical or ecological? Um, if we're taking a look at two options, is this the most profitable enterprising question? And then that gut feeling question, because we still have intuition, and it's a very strong piece to our lives. We have something called the vagus nerve that runs from the base of our, uh, base of our brain down to our jaw, down to our chest, and down to our stomach. And we are connected to our... Um, to our primate selves because when we have this flight, fight, or freeze situation, our whole body goes, okay, uh, the, jar, the jaw tightens up, our chest starts to tighten, or our stomach feels a bit fluttery. It happens every single time we make these decisions, and we need to be able to account for that. So 
what we have is we just have a column here, and I use this with my own decisions, and we use this with our business decisions. Here's the date, and if it's a yes, if it's a no, if it's a I don't know, if we need to make more information, we are, we're able to go through this really quickly. The other thing that this is great for is spot checks. So here, <clears throat> we went through a spot check recently. We found out that in finances, there's two things that were a big issue with our forms of production, which was our accounting processes weren't clear, our transparent and timely client processes weren't transparent and timely. We weren't. We didn't feel like we were offering as much abundance to create ecstatic clients. Uh, few of us didn't feel like we had positive relationships with money, so we were able to zero in exactly where the problem was in the landscape, in the human landscape, in our life landscapes. And this was such an incredible piece for us because within five minutes we were able to go, okay, this isn't working for us. We need to do something a little bit different. We need to change our approach. We can't just keep doing the same thing in the same way we do when we take a look at nitrogen deficiency or if we take a look at what are the weeds telling us in the garden. Our life gives us feedback all the time. We get weeds in our garden all the time. So why am I up here talking to you? Why have I been asked to, 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 to teach for you folks? It's because I was chronically suicidally depressed for 17 years of my life. I was told I had eco-despair, that the world was going to shit around me, and, and that's why I felt so uh, so horrible. And you know, permaculture gave me a lot of the tools to be able to work with this because there's this beautiful ac uh, not acronym but adage in permaculture that action dispels despair. So the more I'm in action, the more I'm doing, the less I'm thinking about all of these pieces. The more I'm making good decisions in this decision making process, the more I'm feeling like this is the right way. So it's important for all of us to be able to to make these decisions. And if, like Walt Whitman said, you know, if this insults your soul, there's this great quote, you know. Take in all this information and anything that insults your soul, discard. So if this doesn't work for you, that's fine. I just hope that at some level you get the sense that we do need to design our lives to take a process to do this. That testing process really comes and allows us to move from the conventional model, which is life supports income. So everything we do is for our income. But now we have this different model, which means that we hold quality of life the most dear thing, that life is the most dear thing and income supports that life. So if we do not have the life we want, we change our income sources. We change the variables because we only get one stab at this. We only get to go around once. And uh, a good friend of mine who knows my work just sent me a, a, brilliant, uh, a brilliant email that Harvard, the number one course at Harvard, the number one course that people are teaching on the side to other students that's always booked out, it's not computers, it's not... Um, it's not philosophy, it's life design. They put a life design course together a couple of years ago. It's, it's, you know, this is what we're doing together. So, you know, what life do you want? What is that life that you want? And there's, there's a, a visioning process that I have, and it's actually online underneath my YouTube account, the Javin K. Bradakovich YouTube account. If you go to um, end of PDC, it's also in the notes here at the end. Um, you can go to this, and I think it's at like, 24 minutes and 17 seconds, I go through this visioning process, which I've done with students before, and I've had some really positive feedback, i.e., I had a gentleman, Zach Weiss, say that I went to bed and I woke up clearer than I'd ever been before, because we need to be clear in these processes. I just want to have a shout-out as well to my uh, friends and, and colleagues, Gordon and Barrett, eco-sense.ca. They're just down the road from OUR, and they have this beautiful saying, they live a three-thirds life. A third of their life is for themselves a third of their life is for their income, and a third of their life is for their community. And that's a great piece that I've tried to emulate and bring to what I do as well. So that's holistic life design. That was like, that was going at 40 miles an hour. There's a lot there. I've got a few videos on YouTube where I've gone through it again in a bit more depth, but that's kind of the piece we have around holistic life design. It takes in holistic management and, and it creates a, a ruthless clarity of vision for us. I just want to stop and take a moment and see if there are any clarifying questions that I can answer for people or if people are feeling totally straight on with that, then we can just keep going forward. <laughs> Was that we're all good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. How many people are asleep? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Zero. Okay, good deal, good deal. All right, <clears throat> so let's go on to zones of brilliance. So everybody understands zoning from a permaculture perspective, I hope and I imagine. 
which is zone zero is the center of human initiative. It's where all the human activity happens. And then we go out in zones from one to five. We go outwards, right? And that's where the energy goes. That's where the frequency. We go less and less outwards to zone five. Uh, more intensity is around zone one. And I thought about this one day, and I was talking with um, a partner of a, a, a co-designer of mine, Brandon Bauer, and he goes, you know, uh, an ex-partner of mine had this idea about, like, we have these, these, these brilliant places that we play, these, these, these brilliant zones. And I thought, oh, that's amazing. That's just like the zones in permaculture, because we all, we all work in a cultural currency or a cultural language. So I thought about it more and more, and it's refined to the point to where it's become this bit of a bullseye. And if you haven't asked yourself these three questions, I think these are the three most important questions to ask yourself about life or about business, which is, which are, there's my grammar coming into play, what are your perennial passions? What are the things that you continually come to, that your friends continually want you to shut up about, that when you go home at Thanksgiving, you can't help but tell your family about it, and they can't help but tell you to please be quiet because they're not interested. What are those perennial passions that come up time and time and time and time again? What are those things that you will spend, you know, 45 minute troubleshooting technical difficulties with just so you can pass this on to people because you're so stoked about? It? What are those perennial passions? So that's one question. The second one are, is what is your inherent gifts? What are the things that you naturally do well? What are the behaviors, the traits, the skills? When do you work well during the day? I am a horrible after 12 noon till about 4.30. I push through, but if people want me to be on my A game, it's in the morning. If I need to power through a project, I can do it at about 7.30 to 8, and I can keep going, and if I go past midnight, I've got another three hours in. That's a trait. That's a, that's a behavioral trait of mine. A skill of mine is to be able to teach and to pass on information. I'm also really good with computers. I have the ability to pick up things really quickly. I have a gift of being able to really understand people. It comes from being depressed for so many years and knowing that I wasn't being true to myself. So what are those gifts about yourself? And last but not least, what are the problems? What are the problems that you perceive in the world? What are the things that you only see? Nobody else sees just you. Because we all think that the world needs to change. That's a given, but that's like 39,000 cruising altitude uh, looking at the problems of the world. The problems that I see are not the same problems that Sylvia sees. Now, Sylvia was in um, the online course last year, and she has this, this beautiful love to help people find their passion. She has another beautiful love of disaster preparedness. You know, these are loves and problems that we see personally. And if we work outside of these problems, we put one unit of energy in, and it doesn't go as far as when there are problems that we actually see. So let's start to qualify some of this information. Let's start to qualify these questions. Let's grade this information, just like we grade everything that comes into our nursery stock. Is this a, an A1 plant, or is this, a, is this compost? So anything that comes up, like, um, so let's talk about perennial passions. I have a perennial passion for teaching this work. Do I enjoy this? Yes, I do. Do I have skill in this? Yes, I do. Am I more for this? Does it enrich me? Do I have more enjoyment about this? Is it regenerative? If those three things, you say a yes to those three things about the three questions we just, or the three areas we just talked about before, perennial passions, inherent gifts, and perceived problems, then that goes into a zone one of brilliance. That goes into the center part here. Because we're always trying to get to the center of what we're talking about. And this is where your native niches live. This is where all the things that you naturally do well exist. And I just want to dispel a myth, myth right now. You know, we live in a, an era where this one true love, this soulmate conversation goes on. And, you know, that might be true, that might not be true. But we know that institutions, um, they co opt this. It's, you know, I call it Disneyanitis, that there's a one true prince, there's this one true princess for everybody. And, People think about it this way, too. There's this one niche that I will do, and it will be amazing. But that's just not the case. There's lots of things I do. And Stephen Jenkinson of the Orphan Wisdom School has this great saying that, you know, at the end of your life, by God, we hope that you come down to a few of the things that you really love to do. Now, I'm trying out at least three new areas of love right now. One of them is a nursery, just to see if I have the aptitude to do it. 
I tried out a microgreens business that was highly profitable, but it wasn't for me. We have to go out and try these things. This is what nature does. We, we go out and we see if this makes sense to us. So zones of brilliance, these zone ones are things we enjoy, we have skill in, and we regenerate, and that's where we start. We start with those things. Start with the low-hanging fruit. Why make things hard for yourself? Zone two are things we enjoy, we have skill in, don't necessarily find regenerative. We can experiment with those things. We can see where those things live. Zone three are things we only have skill in, or pardon me, we, we, we have we enjoyment in, and they're regenerative, but we don't have skill in, we don't quite know about it. This for me is SketchUp. I spent the last two days really upping my game in SketchUp. Two weeks ago I was learning something called QGIS, which if you're a designer, if you're looking for open source software for GIS, it's incredibly powerful. Zone four, things that we just have skill in. I like to call this the in case of emergency break glass zone. I don't want to go and show people how to do their resumes. I have that skill, but I haven't done that since university. I still could pull it out. And then zone five, things we don't enjoy, we don't have skill in, and we don't find regenerative. Don't do it. If you've gone through the entire PDC. There's things that you don't love, you don't have skill in, you don't find regenerative. You see them as necessary, but you don't have to do them. That's why we guild with other people. This is the social aspect of permaculture. We work with people who do these things naturally. Multi-instructor PDCs do these things quite well. So what does this look like when we start going through this process together and we start seeing where these places, where can we play? Well, in inherent gifts, right? There's things that we are and have in our zone one with our perennial passions. There's things with our zone one with perceived problems, there's things with our zone one, and you know where you end up if you've got those three places? You end up in this place called Nerdvana, where you're so excited about everything you're talking about. And it's like when you come to permaculture gatherings or conferences or convergences or even your course, it's where you get so nerdy and you're like, oh my god, I just found this amazing planet and does these amazing things. And we can be that big yellow dog with other people who understand and know us. But we don't have to worry about um, putting that energy into something that maybe not isn't going to come back and become regenerative. So of course I made a I made a sheet out of this. I made a, a regenerative sheet. It was very much based on uh, one of the students and a good friend of mine, Susan Cousineau, who's a brilliant ecologist within permaculture, um, just doing some amazing work out there. So she put this together and I've, I've fine-tuned it over the years. But here we go again, right? now. Folks in the course that I ran felt like there were more zones because there was more combinations. And fair enough, there are, but for simplicity and the fact that we're only really working on things that are low-hanging fruit, especially when we're starting. So think about this in teaching. You know, zone one, um, these are the places, and uh, you know, you know, public speaking or cooking for groups, um, tending or healing with animals, interacting with wildlife. Diagrammatic sketches, you know, it's so diverse. Broadcasting seed, baking bread, horseback riding, um, bartering, haggling, um, using radio, voice only, uh, voice over, uh, voice only communication, like podcasts, and then behaviors, working with others, moving, timing, lifting, traits, connecting with strangers. Like these are places where we where we play and we understand. Now, um, you know, there's lots of different zones you can play here, and you can get lost in filling out these zones, but really. We're looking for zone one. We're looking for what's easy out there. Um, I like to do this process, and you might have already done this, um, you know, unconsciously. But I like to make these what's called fire and um, fire and compost lists. And Sev, who took the Seven Ravens Permaculture course, this was a part of our training, which was go through the entire PDC and what absolutely excites you and what absolutely doesn't has to go back to the compost for for uh, decomposing has to come back as fertile soil. So you do this for life, and for folks who are in permaculture, we do this for permaculture. So in the center here, we have all the different aspects of permaculture, and then you just place them on compost or fire. I'm going to show you a test case study here of a woman who really didn't like to map, and she thought she should be a mapper, but she let go of that, and all of a sudden she was just she was off to the races because she didn't need to worry about that anymore. So you know, even in teaching, get a sense of like what are the things in teaching that you really love, and what are the things you don't love, what are the things you don't like to teach. What are the ways you don't like to teach? You may not like to teach like this. I think it's a lot of fun, right? It feels like I've got my own little TV show. I've got like props behind me. I've got this little title bar. Like, how cool is that? It's all free. It's all on the internet. It's, I love that. That might not be for you. You might need to teach to small groups or large groups or, you know, Jude's a great example. 
Jude has this beautiful little niche that only three other you know, groups or organizations really play in, which is advanced teaching. Right? That's a whole niche for people to play in. That's a place where everyone can play. And so just get a sense of the things that really work for you or really don't work for you. And then don't work in anything else beside those things. So, you know, this is a case study. Uh, great passion, remediating soil. Um, lots of inherent gifts of writing, interviewing, storytelling. Um, problem this person saw in the world, no remediation resource. Well, my friend and colleague, Lila Darwish, right? She, she didn't have the, all this skill, but she had the ability. She had the ability to show and to present and to interview this to everybody out there. And now she is, this is a, uh, coming on as a part of her work. She's still an activist. She's still very much a part of the LNG pipeline protests, and a lot of the success there was, was due to her facilitation and organization, but she just found the intersection there. Um, another, uh, another case study here. So uh, passion for women in agriculture. Um, again, writing, interviewing, storytelling. No source for women in permaculture stories. This was one of the TAs we had down in Cuba, and this is a dark photo, but this is Trina Moyles. Uh, Trina's writing this brilliant book called Women in Sustainable Agriculture. She's traveled to seven different countries already. There's seven different chapters in her book. She's creating this podcast called Women in Permaculture. Right? This is a place where she gets to play and she gets to build an audience. She gets to create what's called an audience-based business, which is what we do with blogs and other understandings. So brilliant, another great case study. So uh, somebody else who had a great, uh, great passion of expressing designs great gift of illustration and a designer in need of good maps. So out there in the permaculture world, this was a student in one of my PDCs. Um, <clears throat> this guy, he, he ended up becoming my, my map maker because as an artist for many years, when I'm working with a pencil, if it doesn't look beautiful, I won't send it out or it'll stay on my desk for, for weeks. So this gentleman, student of mine, I, I got him into business. He was, he was able to make money off of his designs and now he's in landscape architect school. Uh, he's so busy, he doesn't have time for me anymore, so I've trained another student. So if we don't have these skills, you know, if these skills aren't in zone one, we can pass these on to somebody else. Another friend of mine loves doing epic shit. This is just a passion for him. It's this, this archetype, this mem, loves interviewing, thought that there was a lack of permaculture business examples. This is Diego Footer, runs the Permaculture Voices podcast, talks to all these people, makes this beautiful way of interacting with permaculture, has grown the ability for the professional and the conventional world to interact with permaculture because it doesn't look like another hippie garden. It looks like what people can understand. Now this doesn't work for everybody in permaculture and that's okay. You don't have to be the person for everybody in permaculture. You just have to be yourself. The most important piece for us to be is to, to be within our original native niches and not to try to emulate everybody else out there. So how do we explore those niches? How do we understand what potentially we could do. Maybe we find an intersection. Well, once we get that idea, we basically use it, we test it against our, our, uh, our zones of brilliance and against our holistic context because we use our holistic context in everything we do. I had a, had a student who was taking the holistic uh, life, or uh, cultivated life design, doing his holistic life design process. He calls me up a couple of weeks later. He goes, I have more disposable income. I have uh, more, f more delicious food. I'm fitter because for an entire week, all I did was make a list of contacts and run every single decision every day through his holistic context, and it became this well-honed surgical tool. Because if we don't refine our tools, they don't become strong surgical tools. So he was able to, uh, was hone this, and he, he was ecstatic when he called me. He was so ecstatic because this is a tool that worked, and he was able to use it. And again, if it doesn't work for you. Great, awesome. Go find something else that works for you. But just please understand that being able to have some life design is really important. So here's a question that I like to ask everybody if you get an idea of a niche. And so this is, uh, we or I work with these kinds of people struggling with these kinds of problems who feel this type of way about that problem, helping them to get these kinds of results. And this is um, taken from my good buddy, uh, Tad Hargraves, marketingforhippies.com. If you feel weird about marketing, all I have to say is go and uh, take a look at his, his blog and take a look at his courses. Absolutely dollar for dollar, moment for moment, worth all the time that you put into it. So how does this look with a case study? Well, you know, here's a non-permaculture example so you can get a sense of it. I help parents 
who are at the end of the rope successfully stop the power struggles to connect with their kids and restore peace at home. This is Kathy Whitman, Parenting Beyond Words. So, beautiful piece, very tight niche. She gets a sense about what she's doing. We did this at uh, PV2 this year. I had a gentleman, uh, Rob Kaiser, you can look him up, look him up deliberate, uh, deliberate Living Systems. Within 10 minutes, he was able to go from uh, people not understanding what he was doing to having everybody understand and be interested about what he did as a business or as a teaching. If you are thinking about going into teaching, please do this. Understand who works with you best. Understand who you work with. Uh, the reason why we're successful is we work with a specific type of person. It's what all permaculture and, and application looks like. Here's a case uh, case study of this. You know, I did this er, uh, eat shoots and leaves microgreens business, 16 square feet of space. Um, rapidly prototyped it in eight weeks. Um, so what was our niche statement? What did we do? Well, we provided healthy eating aficionados, star for good food, high quality, same day cut microgreens that are so nutritionally and, uh, and delicious. Uh, no, so nutrition, delicious and nutritionally dense. People can feel the difference. We knew what we were doing, and you need to know what you're doing. You need to go and get good information. Like if you're interested in microgreens, this is the guy to go and talk to. This is Luke Callahan, good buddy of mine, complete guide to growing and selling microgreens. Go on to localbusinessplans.com backslash microgreens dash permaculture dash bc. This is in the slides afterwards. You know, for sixty bucks, you can learn how to grow all the microgreens you want, and it's. Brilliant business, but it's again, it's a niche piece. So it's like we take our testing questions and we see if this works for us. I found out that growing microgreens was not right for me. It was a successful business. I was producing anywhere between three hundred and six hundred dollars income a week, I was making about thirty-seven dollars an hour. Uh, but I didn't like standing on concrete watering my microgreens because we were doing it uh, during Victoria's winter. It just wasn't for me. So I like to think of things in tessellated patterns. This is the the honeycomb pattern. This is how. These are able to put so many cells side by side and maximize that space. Modular living works this way. We've got our whole under management, what we're managing, which is our life. We have a holistic context, which is what we want for our life. We have our zones of brilliance to understand the bullseye of what we want to do now around that. We have this beautiful membrane, which is our testing questions, which ensures that good decisions and income streams come into our life and things that don't fit us go out. So over the years, I've been able to bring a lot of income streams into my life just by doing this. So I teach permaculture design courses. I mentor people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I coach people. Um, I do speaking. I do consulting. I do installs and design. And then out to the, the edges, I you know I do short courses. I do a couple of online products that I created for introductory to the food forestry, to introductory to hygge culture. It's this thing that not a lot of people knew. It was a passion of mine. So. I'm just in the final processes of finishing my book about hygge culture, because I've done more than five kilometers of hygge culture in North America. It's, you know, it's yeah, a lot of people other have done hygge culture, but it's something I'm interested in. I teach internationally. I Skype teach like we're doing. I do webinars. I'm moving into tree crops. I'm moving into nurseries. I voice act. I had a beautiful little uh, job the other day. I, I got a voice over an owl for a nature center because I love it. We're these multifaceted beings. We're polyculture beings. We're not monoculture beings. We're moving into a land assessment business, but I don't do microgreens anymore. It's not what I do. It's not who I am, so I don't want to do it, so I let that go. Um, so all of these things, all these questions, what are these things for you? What are these What are these income streams? What are these places where you like to play that you've had the ability to see a little bit of, of income come in? Well, this is a model that I adapted from Tad. Um, I'm graphically based. I really, uh, really like seeing things visually, so I'll just quickly go over this in the last seven minutes we have here and let you know how this looks. Um, oh, pardon me. Maybe I won't. <laughs> I'll just explain it to you. So pathways are really about how people find you as a designer, as a, just just burn this image into your mind. Oh, we're going all over the place. Uh, burn this image into your mind and then I'll come back and uh, I'll just talk you through this. So at the, the top of this potted plant, if you want to think of it that way, We've got the branching structures, the dendritic structures that go out into the world. And all of these places are hubs. These are all places where people potentially can find us and what we do. But if you don't know what you do, then you can't go to a hub. I can't go out there and go to a bunch of wastewater technicians if I don't know what I do, if I don't know the problems I solve for them. I can't go to that hub and tell them what I do. I was approached by the uh, Canadian Organic Association 
uh, for British Columbia to be their keynote speaker about this process this year. I was down in Cuba, unfortunately, and I wasn't able to do it, but they approached me to be a keynote on life design. They didn't approach me to talk about water strategies. Um, they approached me about life design because this was a hub that we could talk about, and I could talk to these people because this is about cultivation. You know, before we get cultivating, we have to get clear. We have to know where our hubs are, where are the people where we can play and places where we can play. Where are the orders of magnitude in the system? If everyone remembers their key line design from their PDC, you know, where do we play in here? And then we go down to our platform, which are the seven things we can be known for. And Tad really goes into this, and it's brilliant. He goes by step by step. You know, we can we you can be known for yourself. You can be known for how you bring people from their their problems, the problems and the island that they're on, this island of problems, and we bring them all the way over to Solution Island on our boat on the goods and services we offer them. People come into the cultivated life design process because I offer a clear process, go step by step, that allows people to take all this jumble in here and get it clear, and then they're able to, to use it as a tool. Now, it doesn't work for everybody because mm -hmm. some people don't work in this process, but I know what I do and I can communicate it to people. And then finally, at the bottom, if you remember the, the little lines in that, what's called package, how do you capture and store people's interest and in their their, their intrigue and what they want. So, you know, I run this course on a yearly basis. It usually runs between about you know, 450 bucks, but I also work one-on-one -on -one with people for my hourly rate. I also have a small package that people can buy for 25 bucks that has these worksheets that has you know all this information that kind of goes through it that they can do the home study course if they're interested. Um, doesn't have all of the video and everything else. So I have the ability to capture people at their interest level, because not everybody wants to take a course online for 500 bucks. Some people just want to kind of take a look at it for themselves. Some people want to, you know, go at their own pace. So, at the end of my PV courses, uh, my PV sessions, I took a advice from another presenter, and I developed this little USB stick where anybody could buy it for 25 bucks, and they could just be like, okay, great, I can work on this my own. And then they look at that information, and they can work at their own level. So, if you are an educator, let's take this back to you. If you like to educate people, how do people interact with you? Do you have a free blog? Do you hate writing but don't do it? Do you like video? I like video. I got 23 videos out. I got at least that many in a backlog. If that's what you love to do and if that's how you like to play, the way and the type of marketing that works is the type you'll do. So if you don't like writing, if you don't like blogging, if you don't like any of it, you find somebody else to work with, like my buddy Zach Weiss did with uh, Raleigh, brilliant web designer. Folks are looking for him. If you go to Ecological Summit, <clears throat> the Montana Ecological Summit, which is on my webpage right now, Permaculture BC, or if you go to, um, uh, what is it, Element Ecosystems, which is Zach's, um, Zach's business, you can find out about it all there if you're looking for good people. But how do you capture and store that energy? This is all based on permaculture. Okay? So uh, as we round the bend here with three minutes for our 45, and uh, thanks so much for staying with me and, and going through this with me. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, as we round the bend, I don't think enough people really go out there and, and really challenge people. So here's my challenge to you. After you finish your course with Jude, then the 10 days afterwards, in only 10 hours, um, and only spending up to $100 or no money at all, you know, go out there and test an idea. Go out there and take what you've learned from Jude's course about teaching, or maybe you're more of a designer, or maybe this is just something else. But go out there and offer a short course. Go out there and, and talk to a local gardening club. Go out there and offer something at a library but literally put it into practice. Don't just be in this course for infotainment. Don't just be here to, to just take it all in and meet these great people, but actually go out there and get going because we need everybody working at how they work in a real quick session because if we don't have you guys working, we, we can't get to where we need to go in the world we need to go. Um, I'm going to be offering a 12-week course on this. I got a lot of great feedback from Sylvia and others in the course last year. That was a lot of information. So. Instead of doing one session every week, we're going to do one session every two weeks. We're just going to focus on the holistic decision-making process. Um, we're going to a little bit touch on zones of brilliance, but really focus on how to get a really good um, decision-making process. I'm, I'm only going to open it up to 10 spots. really want to be focused with people here. Um, and if folks are interested about that, there's lots of information on the website. And there's also lots of information at this URL, which is um, permaculture. Whoa, we're totally running ahead. Come back and all excited here. Uh, Permaculturebc.com backslash CLD dash 2015. So if folks uh, want to get the slides for this, basically there's a survey there that just 
lets me know if this was useful for, to you or if it wasn't or what else you're interested in. So there's a survey there. If you fill out the survey, um, the thank you that comes up immediately afterwards has a Dropbox link, Dropbox link that has all of these slides in there. I just uploaded them. You can download them. That's for you. That's my thanks for doing the survey. Uh, there's also a link on there if you if you want to purchase all those uh, worksheets and you want to have all of the accompanying uh, explanations. And there's a lot of great um, uh, material in there. There's a lot of extra material in there. I've got a little um, uh, diagram of, of all the information in there. There's this great article by Hunter Ed Thompson, founder of Gonzo uh, uh, Gonzo News and um, Infamous for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. You know, he talks about how to find your life purpose. Uh, Mike Rowell, great article by him on there. Lots of value in that. Just want to give people a nice head start. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested, feel free to go there. And if folks want, we could take five questions or just have a chat or see if this was useful to anybody because you never really know until you start playing if uh, this resonates with folks. But just wanted to say thanks to everybody. And if folks have to leave because I know there's a couple people who are watching online. Thanks so much for watching. Feel free to send me a note. And uh, same goes for everybody there sitting in the classroom. And I think you guys are probably in touch too. You know, drop me a line if uh, you want to chat. I'm happy to talk to pretty much everybody for a short amount of time. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Source chat. Do you have? Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you have a good source or concept for um, what's the word I'm looking for here? For being a teacher for for I'm trying to find the word here. Brain fart. Oh my god. Hey, Seb, come really close to the mic and speak really clearly. Presenting, presentation. Pronunciate. <laughs> there we go. Um, go. Pronunciate. Yes. Uh, for, for delivering presentation, do you have a good concept or book of knowledge or, or anything like that to, to help focus your mind and focus your physical body? On how to present or how to create a lesson plan, something like that? When you're presenting. Um, for like in the holistic side of things, for different methods for calming your body and calming your mind, so you can stay focused when you're, per se, standing in front of a hundred people to ten people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I do for sure. Um, so, you know, mentally, and if I'm doing something video captured, and I even do this when I present um, in person, what I'll do is I'll watch one or two of the presenters that I really love, the people who I just think are incredible, they're dynamic, I really like how they are, and, and basically I take a bit of their energy and, and allow that to come into my body. Um, and then what I do is I'll just sit for a second, um, deep breaths, in through the nose, out through the mouth. I try to get, if I don't have a lot of time, I try to get to 10. If I've got a lot of time, I try to get to 100, and I count each breath, so that's one. And if I lose the count internally, I go back to zero. And being a guy who's tried meditation for many years, this is one of the only things I've found that has really centered me to be able to present really well if I'm, if I'm nervous, which we all get sometimes. I presented to uh, city planners a week and a half ago and city engineers and um, a couple of landscape professionals about stormwater management. <clears throat> so these folks, these are folks that are professionals. They work at their... Their, their level of expertise. And I'm a guy who doesn't have a professional designation. I just, I watch a lot of water and I see what happens. So I, I definitely got a lot, I, I got quite nervous there. And when I got up in front of them to, to tell them key line, I basically gave them the disclaimer that I was really worried about. And I used to do this with garden clubs. Because when you go and teach at a garden club, the average age of a garden club is what? 68, 69? 75. These people have sandals that are older than I am. <laughs> and so you've got all these people looking at you, and you know the, the first thing on their mind is, who is this guy? Why is this guy talking to me? Like, he's going to tell me about gardening? And so I give my biggest fear to the audience. And so with you guys today, I've taught a lot with 
OUR. I've done a lot. Uh, I guest taught pretty much every year after I was in that course, the Advanced Permaculture Teachers Training course. So what I do is I give my frustrations or my worries, I give them to the audience. So if folks download the Permaculture Voices 2 audio, which I highly recommend, there's so many good talks in there. Paul Stamets gave an amazing one if you're in pasture cropping, if you're into teaching. Definitely download that because it's like do's and don'ts. There's some great stuff and then there's some folks here like, okay, you can take some learnings from that. Anyways, in that first presentation, I was on hour 44 with two hours of sleep because I came right from Cuba to go teach there. I gave that to the audience. I said, I'm on hour 44. I don't know how this is going to come off. I hope it's useful. Uh, I hope I talk coherently. Uh, when I started teaching, I'm dyslexic. And you know, when you're nervous, you get more dyslexic. Or when you're frustrated, you get more of this. So I always gave it to the audience in a fun way. You know, with the gardening club, I always said, I literally said, you folks have sandals that are older than I am. And I just let that sit. <laughs> and they would all chuckle. And I would say, I'm not here to teach you about gardening. I want you guys to teach me about gardening. And all of you could be up here teaching me. And that reduces the fear of everybody. They're like, OK, who's this guy? Who's this, who's this person teaching to me? And I say, I'm just here to tell you about something I know about. And the things that I mostly talk about uh, to gardeners is, what's permaculture? And I take it from a design standpoint. And then what's hooviculture? Because that's something I've really specialized in. And now I talk about cultivated life design. So I tell you guys that I was chronically depressed for 17 years, that I was suicidal during that time, and I've moved out of it. Because that's a bit of why you should listen to me. And if you don't give that to people, then why should they listen to you? If you don't give them the context of why you're here, then you know what are you doing? Same thing with all teachers. I, I find that when teachers give their humanity to the audience, the audience gives it back and forth. So that's what I do. Thank you. That was beautiful. Awesome. Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Hey, uh, I, uh, just, can you say the, the source again for that GIS thing? Yeah. It's called Quantum GIS or QGIS. Free download. Um, I was skilling up in it a couple of weeks ago. Brilliant software to being able to do uh, water flow analysis, to do watershed analysis, um, to be able to generate contour maps and contour lines. Um, really great tool for that. Um, like all tools, it all depends on what's the quality of information that comes in. So what is the resolution of the information that comes into the program will be the resolution of the information that goes out. So for example, in Alberta, the province beside us, I don't. last year there was a lot of Americans in the course, so I just want to give people relevance here. Um, because it's an oil gas province and because of the amount of drilling that goes on, the company created a complete LIDAR flyover which is a high resolution way to create imagery. Uh, so you can produce things that have five centimeter contour, right? high resolution. You can purchase that information for $500 a square kilometer, whereas in places where I've had to contract LIDAR to create the maps we need, that can be up to two to $3,000. So if we get that high grade information like a place in Alberta or if you are in a place where there, there might be LIDAR information, which comes from, <coughs> excuse me, which comes from uh, different uh, sources and can be purchased again from folks. That's high grade information. If you're really good at surveying, you have a really great technique to survey. Uh, my buddy Rob Avis in Verge Permaculture, he really gave me a couple of great tips and tricks to have high grade survey. Um, you know, we have the ability now to create high data points which we can then take into something like QGS and we can create high survey maps. Or if we get into uh, drone mapping, and we bring in drone information with uh, with photogrammetry, or if we, we we use lidar ourselves, we can then bring that into a suite of design tools, and we can create our, our own material as opposed to ArcGIS, which is anywhere between I've heard three to ten thousand dollars. Which you know, for folks just starting off, we don't have that. We have to bootstrap. So. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about anything under the sun? Because it feels like we'll talk about anything at this point. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in and ask another question. Sure. What was the most motivating thing Jude taught you? Hmm. 
Mm, that's a great question. I've taken a lot of great pieces of wisdom from Jude. Um, I think one is is that some people need, some people design their lives, and I think we all need it to a certain extent. But I think Jude lives who she is on a daily basis. You know, she has this this design business. She has this um, hedgerow. She teaches advanced permaculture. I think, like all great people, the ones that I really look up to and the ones that really motivate me are the ones that just live their life the way they want to and the way that they feel is the most important to people. I think those those are the traits I really take away. Jude also taught me to be overprepared, to always have more data, confirmation, explanation. Um, she gave me a little bit of personal feedback, which changed my life. So if you know if you're ever sitting there and Jude gives you something or whispers something, and you might take it as being a little bit frustrating. That's that's really information coming into you and going, okay, you know that's coming up against something about myself. And there's been a lot of people in my life who who've been willing to, to bridge that gap and go, I'm going to give you some information about yourself that you might not necessarily like. And that's probably the most useful information because most people who say, you know, how did you like it? And they're like, it's okay. It's like, that's not the most useful information to me. The most useful information, especially in a teaching situation, a teaching teaching situation like you guys are in, is help me improve. Help me to improve. Um, so Jude gave me a lot of, of those points. Um, her ability to check in with people I thought was very beautiful, which I've taken. Her ability to land people in a space was was brilliant. Um, I would say her ability to connect with people personally. The, the, the table talks she does, the going out to meet every single individual person or make the effort to and communicating that, the transparency she has in her life and in her teaching. Um, yeah, she's been one of the most incredible mentors I've had and I use the word not by saying we have um, we have like a specific relationship just that like we're colleagues now who work on different aspects and and exchange with each other and just by knowing that that exists in the world I think is a very important piece for us to understand as educators thank you you're welcome um, the one thing I'll say is this is that as you go out and you go into design or you go into teaching or you have to go out like we're, we're in a place where there's no university we don't get to go to the permaculture university um, you know some people will say that's the road of life um, and they're true to a certain extent but how do you how do you evaluate your teachers in that situation how do you start to understand who's out there to teach um, I like to say you know go out ask your teachers who taught you or ask the people who you're learning about for design who taught you? What have you done? Can I see that work? Can I talk to people who worked with you? I think all those things are important. But after that's finished, I had a gentleman come up to me in um, at PV2. He comes up to me. He goes, "How do we, as early designers, how do we go out and learn how to design? How do we learn from you what you know after six years of doing this?" And uh, as somebody said today, who called me up for a bit of mentoring and just like, "Hey, I'll." pay your hourly rate, I just need to talk to you, I need to get my, my life straight. So I talk with him a little bit and he goes, like, how do I get to where you are? Because you did it so quickly. You did it like you were designing within two year two and three and now you're doing international work in year six. How did you do it so quickly? And um, I told them, but I've come up with something that's quicker. So if it's of interest to you, I'll pass it on, which is find the people who you want to learn from. And I do this at my level. I reach out to other people. I reach out to the Sepulters, the Darren Dartys, the Dan Housleys, the Craig Sponholtz. If you don't know these names in your design, you should know these names because these are the names to look at. I'm colleagues with these people. I chat with these people. We have conversations. But the other thing I do is I go, hey, I need to know more about this. I'd like to, uh, do you have a mentoring rate or do, like, what's your, what's your hourly rate? I'll pay that. But I'll host something like this. I'll host a Google Hangout. You can get up to 10 people in a Google Hangout. So let's say, because uh, I'm doing this with um, a designer whose rate is $150. And we can get frustrated by that, which sometimes happens when you're, and I'm just saying because I live there, when you're out on the West Coast, it's like, oh, it's so much money. But you got to think about it. That's a lot of value that that person brings. 
they they brought 25 years of education and, and, and mistakes, and that's really what we pay for when we, we pay for courses. We pay for people's mistakes. So this person tells me it's 150 bucks. They don't have a mentoring rate. I say, no problem. Great. How many people can we have up to the call? He's like, you can have as many people as you want. So I go about, and I host a little session, and I say, great. I've got a special uh, course, which is exactly how this QGIS course was run. It's a buddy of mine who said, I've got five spots. I'm only putting it out to other designers. This is the cost. We're not negotiating on it. If you want in, get on in. Yeah, I saw the value in it. So you have this little mastermind session that you say that, except maybe it's you, and you or this gentleman who just talked to me and wants to know about QGIS or design, he calls me up and says, hey, I want to have an hour of your time. What's, what's your hourly rate? This is my hourly rate. Great, I'm going to get five people together. This is the time, uh, and we're going to ask you question after question after question because when you pay for somebody's time, that's what you're paying for. Well, I've done this now for the last four years. I've done it informally. I'm doing it a bit more formally now, and I'm getting together people. I'm getting together other designers. We're getting together for a little mastermind session. I'm charging them because I'm organizing it. I'm putting it together. The burden is on for me to create this little mini course, and then this person comes in, this this big designer or this big teacher, and they give us all the information that we're asking for. We could ask the questions that we might think are too stupid in a group setting. And let's face it, I can't go down to every single course. I can't constantly skill up everywhere and every single day of my life. So I call up Jude, and I'm like, Jude, I want to do. I want to go deeper into that one thing you talked about. And I've got five people who are interested. What's your rate? Oh, your rate is 100 bucks. Great. We'll each pay 25 bucks. I'll collect the money. I'll give it to you beforehand. That way you're secured. You know it's happening. This is what happened to me at PV2. I had this guy come up to me, and we've already done this whole process where, you know, what, two weeks later, we've already been on, online twice. And he is so excited because for a fraction of the price of paying me personally, and some people want to, and that's great and that's awesome, we get to have this connection. So whatever you want to go and do, be it, you know, working with composting toilets or doing disaster design or working with mushrooms, there's somebody out there who knows it better than you. And to go up to that person and be like, hey, you know, can I have an hour of your time? That doesn't value them, and that that you don't bring value to that person. You're just saying, "Give me something," and we're done with that. That's that's the old way of thinking. The prime directive of permaculture is to take responsibility for yourselves and for that of our children. And take responsibility says, "I want this information. I value your time. This is how I'm going to value your time, and let's do this." And then all of a sudden, that person comes in, and they're stoked to be there. They're giving you everything you need, and they're helping you to be the person you want to be. I can't think of a better way to learn. I wish I had thought of it five years ago because I would have been I would have been here where I am now two years ago. And I just keep scaling up. I find wastewater technicians who I say, hey, great, can I have uh, an hour of your time? What's your design rate or what's your, your teaching rate? And they go, what do you mean? Like, aren't we just sitting down for a beer? I said, yeah. He's like, buy me a beer. And some of these people will do that for you. Some of these people will absolutely work with you that way. Other people will say, listen, I, I'm really busy. Like, People who want my time this time of year, I'm going hour after hour, minute after minute. I'm working 12, 14 hours a day. I have 25 design projects. You can see the board behind me, my little think tank. I've got six different uh, cultivated light design clients. You know, I've become a contributing editor with Permaculture Magazine. I'm working with Maddie Harlan. I've got all these great projects. My time is valuable because at the end of the day, I really value just sitting down or talking with my significant other or going and taking a look at my food forest. That's important to me. So, you know, really think about, and we can rile against the system. I think money needs to change. I'm totally with you on that. But your fight can go into that, or your fight can go into the fight that's important, which is cultivating the land. Just choose wisely. Have a really important clarity of vision. Allow things, allow that to carve what you need out of life and to let go of the fat and let go of the people who might not be working for you. And just constantly come back to what works for me. Because at the end of the day, we need every single one of you doing exactly what you're great at and being exceptional at it to be and to create the world that we need. And we don't need any more time to, to think about it or to, to, to ponder about it. We need you in action. So I really hope you folks, after Jude's course, you just go out there and you make a lot of mistakes and you get out there and you become incredible instructors um, you just do what you need to do because um, I need more people. Jeff Lawton needs more people. We need more people out there. So thank you so much. I really appreciate appreciate you spending the time. I know it's late, but um, I really appreciate it. Give Jude as much um, thanks and um, and 
love and gratitude as you can. She's an incredible instructor. You're incredibly lucky to be there. Your TA, incredible woman as well. You're incredibly lucky to be there. Just give a lot of gratitude and always give a lot of gratitude to the people in your life because we don't do it enough. So thanks so much. My name's Javin. Uh, I've been with you today. And if you want to talk about that, uh, those surveys, that's the URL right there. You can go on there, fill out the form, or if you want to purchase the worksheets, go for it. But thanks so much, folks. I really appreciate it. Awesome, Javin. Thank you so much. I personally appreciate this. And thank you for working through the hardship of getting it together. All the best, folks. Take care, and hopefully we'll see, see you out in the field. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Javin. I will take you up on your hourly thing. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Take care. Bye.